Welcome to the Mongolian Real Estate Presentation, Opportunities and Challenges by Chris Pellegrino. I am currently the managing partner of MAD Investment Solutions, a dedicated real estate firm based in Utah. MAD Investment Solutions was established in 2009 and has since taken part in over 1,500 real estate transactions across all asset classes and throughout Mongolia. We have offices in both Utah, the capital city, as well as Talentagat in the South Korea. We're now going to explore Mongolia's market fundamentals. Mongolia has a population of 2.7 million people, of which 1.2 million people live in its capital city, Ulaanbaatar. We have a national urbanization rate of around 63%, but what is most interesting is that we have an extremely young and dynamic population with an average age of only 22 years old. The GDP per capita of the country is still remarkably low at around 3,500 US dollars, but it is estimated by the IMF and the World Bank that by 2020, we will reach a GDP per capita of nearly 12,000 US dollars. This increase in GDP is of course caused by Mongolia's current mining boom, of which the Oitolga mine is a perfect example, with nearly 7 billion US dollars of direct foreign investment into Mongolia. This, by itself, will have a considerable impact on Mongolia's real estate sector. Interestingly, only 9% of real estate transactions in Mongolia are currently mortgaged, a low rate by international standards. Furthermore, only 2% of those mortgages are considered non-performing, again, an extremely low percentage by global standards. This is caused mostly by the high interest rates charged by the banks for mortgages at nearly 19% and the low terms of only 3 to 10 years. Bear in mind that this is a massive improvement over the last few years and is expected to keep improving for the foreseeable future. Let us now look at the Ulaanbaatar market in particular. As mentioned earlier, 1.2 million people live in the capital city, of which 700,000 live in the Gur districts. The Gur districts considerably grew in proportions by nomads who moved to the city following the loss of their cattle in the extremely harsh winters of 2001 and 2002, as well as those who have moved more recently in search of better jobs in economic prosperity. Case in point, the population of Ulaanbaatar has grown by 75% over the past 10 years. The Gur district, as you can see from this picture, is a mix of semi-urban and nomadic housing structures. It has extremely limited access to city infrastructure, such as sewers, roads, electricity, or even running water. Ulaanbaatar is made up today of approximately 116,000 residential units. This includes all immovable property, such as apartments, townhouses, as well as those small wooden and brick houses in the Gur district. Today, the average price per square meter in the city centre is at around 1,300 US dollars, a considerable increase over the last few years. Ulaanbaatar is still a very exciting real estate investment destination. We find investors realizing an average of 9% net rental yields, while capital growth has been steadily increasing by about 20% per annum over the last five years. Let's now look at the demand factors that are pushing up the prices of real estate in Mongolia. First of all, is the increasing expat population moving into Ulaanbaatar. Expats still form a relatively small segment of the market, with only four to 6,000 estimated full-time residents which have mid to senior level positions and are likely to rent apartments. The majority of those expats work in the mining or the mining supply chain industries. Unlike cities such as Hong Kong and Singapore, Ulaanbaatar expats are here for the short term, on average 18 months and have proven to be an extremely volatile segment, as was proven during the 2009 and 2000 crisis. We thus always recommend to our investors to consider the domestic market as the only viable exit strategy for their investments. With Mongolia's economic growth comes an increasing number of high net worth individuals. It is estimated that a new millionaire is created every day, while there are certainly more than a few new billionaires created every year. Interestingly, these Mongolian high net worth individuals enjoy investing in property, mostly with a view of renting them out to high paying expats. This is unlike their Chinese counterparts who purchase property simply on the basis of capital growth and rarely rent them out. Of course, before these high net worths think of purchasing properties and investments, they would like to buy their own prestigious property, an address that truly demonstrates wealth. This type of property does not yet exist in the markets with the possible exception of the Blue Sky Tower on Tsukmatar Square, which apartments are currently in the market at 8,000 US dollars per square meter, but they are only 12 units in total. This presents an exciting opportunity for investment, 
even if this segment of the market is limited to a few select individuals. Foreign direct investment is playing an increasingly big role in Mongolia's real estate markets. Companies such as Mongolia Growth Group, MDR, or even ourselves are impacting demand levels in Mongolia, particularly on larger ticket purchases. As increasing amounts of FDI flows into the country, it is bound to inflate overall real estate prices, in particular as those foreign companies constantly outbid each other on the same targets. We have ourselves witnessed enormous changes in the actual profile of foreign investors in Mongolia. Six years ago, a typical client was someone directly connected to Mongolia, who either worked here or had the Mongolian affinity and would invest into real estate as a side project. We then saw the arrival, about three to four years ago, of the high net worth investors who will come to Mongolia with the single purpose of investing and will be looking to put around a million dollars in play. Since the summer of 2011, we have seen a dramatic increase of inquiries from large scale institutional clients looking for minimum ticket sizes of approximately 5 million US dollars. As foreign investment levels into Mongolia keep increasing, we are likely to see more and more larger scale institutional players enter the market, while small investors will be priced out. By far the biggest factor driving our prices is the emerging middle class of Mongolia. As mentioned earlier, we have a young, dynamic and well-educated population, which is actively participating in Mongolia's economic boom. Disposable income levels have increased considerably over the last five years, set to go up again in 2012 as the government raises all government salaries and pensions by 43%. This young population with increasing disposable income is now, slowly, taking an active participation in Ulubatar's real estate markets. The average size of a household in Ulubatar is currently made up of seven people with an average apartment size of only 65 square meters. A busy apartment, I am sure you will agree. Members of those multi-generational homes are now keen to set up their own smaller households with just the parents and the kids and model much closer to the European or American system. To be able to achieve this, young families need access to mortgages, something that a number of developers and banks are starting to realise. The MCS Shingo project is a perfect example of this, with nearly 4,000 small apartments ranging in size between 25 square metres and 45 square metres, along with easy access to mortgages, they are proving extremely popular as a starter home. New investment opportunities exist in the form of modular construction, affordable housing, in the suburbs of Lombardar or in high growth secondary cities such as Dalantagat. Now that we have had a brief look at the demand factors, let's explore the supply side factors. Mid to large scale buildings take a minimum of three years and an average of four years to build. So while it might seem that there is a lot of construction going on around Lombardar, it is construction that has been going on for a long time. Clearly, one of the biggest barriers to better supply levels are the freezing cold winter months. For seven months of the year, it is simply too cold to pour concrete. This picture illustrates the problem quite well, but doesn't give an indication that it is nearly minus 40 degrees Celsius outside. Supply is extremely limited, with only an average of 8,000 new immovable property certificates issued each year in a greater Limitar area. This includes all residential, commercial and retail units across all price ranges, from the lowly wooden shack in the Gur district to the palatial homes being built in the North Valley. The rate of supply of new properties has actually dropped over the last couple of years due to the increasing difficulties brought about by Mongolia's economy boom. The biggest constraint on supply comes from the very serious lack of infrastructure. The Russians designed the Lumitar for 350,000 people. Yet, it supports today a million two hundred. This is leading to a general collapse of the entire city infrastructure. On the satellite picture, you can clearly see in red the areas of Lombardar which are covered by central city infrastructure. The rest of this is simply worthless land, as there is no running water, no roads, no electricity, nor sewers. The Mongolian government doesn't have the finances to really expand the reach of the infrastructure, and it is not economically feasible for the private sector to do so. Imagine that UB is similar to Hong Kong or Singapore. You can only build on the existing infrastructure grid. And while it is technically possible to reclaim land, it is often too expensive to do so. The scarcity of buildable land is having a massive impact on the cost of construction, limiting the number of developers to those who have sufficient finances to launch large-scale, mid to high-end developments, or those that have acquired land a few years ago. 
Another supply constraint comes in the form of a shortage of skilled labour. Mongolians have traditionally always been nomads. They have never really built anything durable. During the communist period, the city of Ulaanbaatar was built by Russian engineers and architects, using Chinese labour and Japanese prisoners of war. While Mongolians have built a few buildings, there are few and far between. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transition to market economy, a few Mongolians have learned and perfected the trades of construction, such as plumbery, carpentry, masonry, tiling and so forth. But today they prefer employment in the mine sites, such as Oritolgoi, to working for the Bataille construction companies. They are better paid, fed, housed, receive medical insurance and training from OT, all things which are rarely possible with UB construction companies. This has led to a migration of skilled labour from UB to the south of Kobe, forcing internal Ulaanbaatar developers to hire foreign labour from China, North Korea and now from the Philippines and India. These workers are more expensive and more difficult to manage than Mongolian labourers, and most importantly, they are very hard to source legally, as a legal framework is not really in place to allow mass migration of construction labour into Mongolia. The next supply constraint, and possibly the most significant, comes in the form of access to construction materials. Mongolia imports 95% of its construction materials from either China or Russia. The majority comes from China, on the Beijing UB railway line. But since the South Kobe mining projects have begun, the vast majority of the supply chain is being diverted away from UB towards the OT mine site, amongst others. This is leading to a huge shortage of all types of construction materials across the country forcing construction companies to place their orders six months to a year in advance and stockpile materials prior to the start of construction. This shortage of construction materials is, of course, also impacting prices. As an example, the price of cement has gone up 100% in the last four years and is expected to go up by another 40% this year alone. All of those restrictions on the supply side means the supply cannot keep up with the staggering growth in demand and it is therefore leading to inflation of real estate prices. To give a better idea of what Ulaanbaatar looks like, we have prepared a short introductory video of the city and the opinions of some of its residents. In 1930, the Mongols were the first to live in Mongolia. The Mongols were the first to live in Mongolia. The Mongols were the first to live in Mongolia. Мөнгөсөнцөө When I first came here 13 years ago, there would be cows walking along the main road, uh, horses. Um, I actually saw a couple of deer walking past the university one day. If I go to some of the places I lived in, say, three or four years ago, I can almost get lost because there are so many new buildings. The, 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 the change is, is just unbelievable. It's becoming a modern city in, in every aspect. I lived uh, in London for a total of eight years. I worked for a number of uh, public relations companies in, in the UK. I just saw many opportunities, which is why I returned to Mongolia in June 2010. Although in UB there are only over a million people living, you still 
get that kind of feeling that you're living in a very young, rich, like populated country. You just get struck by it because it's so vibrant and young and full of energy. Having lived in Southeast Asia in most cities where it's impossible to walk around, Ulaanbaatar has wide sidewalks, so for me walking is very important. And then you have all these coffee shops where you can go and have a coffee and a hot chocolate and place to meet. And like most of Asian cities where you don't really have a center, a city center where people can just walk and, and go and have a, a hot chocolate or whatever. So this is something I really enjoy in Nwambata. The economic possibilities are tremendous in, in Mongolia, clearly. Uh, I think this is a country where people want to invest at the moment. That there are very few countries like this in the world, but Mongolia is sitting on a pot of natural resources. The economic rock of Mongolia is not just paper-based, it's grounded in its resources. The boom in the mining sector has created so many jobs. I'm amazed that just one sector has spawned so much other development. You could be doing many, many things. You could be doing art exhibitions, you could be doing quite cool stuff, street art, anything, you know. I think it's a great time for Mongolians to come back at this time and moment and do something that they truly wanted to do for, they, for the rest of their lives. You see the contrast mostly in the architecture of UV. So you see bits of old Soviet architecture at the same time you see like towers and high-rise buildings everywhere and you see hotels like well standard hotels being built up uh, next to one of the oldest uh, monastery. I mean if we look uh, at buildings the quality standards are not yet there for, for many of the buildings I think but too many people try to take too many shortcuts uh, so uh, I have entirely face in all the old buildings. I have very little face in the new building coming up. That's a personal opinion, but I'm an engineer. People do live in 300 square meter apartments, three floors, houses, uh, and other people live in a gear, which is, I've never measured the area of a gear, but it's, it's nowhere near 300 square meters. The city is like somewhere it's kind of unique, you know, because there's like a two different culture here in the city, two different civilization, right? Good this civilization, it still kind of represents the Mongolian way of nomadic life. And then the other part of the city, it represents the modern life. Well, somebody in Mongolia is really at the tipping point, it can go either way. Which way do you think it would go? A uh, better way. <laughs> A better way? Yeah. Now we're on the right direction. We're just starting. We're just at the, at the zero point now. Let's very briefly look at a few of the best opportunities that we currently identify in the Mongolian real estate sector. First of all, our distressed off-plan developments, which are in desperate need of bridge financing. Bear in mind that there is next to no bank financing available to developers. Thus, the vast majority of developers in Bataar rely exclusively on pre-settled apartments to finance construction. A developer in Mongolia will typically have sufficient money to buy the rights to plot of land, obtain the construction permits, pay the architects, do some marketing, and maybe pay for the foundations and a couple of floors of skeleton. From then on, developers have to sell units to be able to build, something notoriously difficult to do in Mongolia, as off plan purchases are not protected by law in the same way as completed property certificates by the state are. This leaves a number of developments standing, idle all around the Limitar, with only a few units left for sale, yet the developers are not able to complete them until those units are sold. This presents exciting opportunities to investors who can then purchase the remaining units at a heavily discounted price, provide financing to the developer to complete the building, and be able to resell those units at a higher margin upon completion. As mentioned earlier, 
Mongolian cities suffer from a critical lack of investment in infrastructure. The scarcity of buildable land is driving up prices and presents an excellent investment opportunity. While it is currently complicated for foreign investors to own lands in Mongolia, there are means and ways around these restrictions. The one investment opportunity risk high return opportunities present in secondary cities all over Mongolia. Those are cities close to the major mine sites and are benefiting from the direct economical impact that those mines are having on the local population. The potential afforded by the cities is enormous, as this is a sector of the Mongolian growth that has truly not yet been exploited. MAD has operations or has invested in those very cities. Airnet is a location of the country's largest operational copper mine and is in desperate need to be redeveloped. The housing stock there is a throwback to the 70s and there is considerable demand for improved facilities. Dahan used to be the industrial sector of Mongolia during the Soviet days, but has since fallen in disarray as the economy picks up again, migration back to the city is currently taking place and we are seeing substantial growth in the city and its potential. Sanshan is one of the fascinating longer term investments. It is strategically positioned on the Beijing Yubi Railway and would be host to the country's largest industrial park, refineries, smelting plants and all the infrastructure needed to add value to mining products. They will come from the mines by rail and then be moved on towards China. Sanchan will play a very important role in Mongolia's future and we want to be invested on the ground before it really takes off. The Lentegat is where we already have a number of large operations as well as an office. It is the capital of the South Gobi AMAC, it is where the regional government sits for the three Gobi AMACs and is the centre of all mining activity in the Gobi region. It is a city that has gone from a population of 7,000 people about five years ago to nearly 40,000 people today and is expected to grow to over 150,000 people in the next six years. It is the base of the mining community and its supply chain. There is so much to do there that it boggles the mind. The last exciting destination was Hanbokt, a small settlement at the gates of the OT license area, and is set to see considerable growth over the next few years as OT takes increasing importance in the national plane. Let's now look at some of the challenges that we have operating in Mongolia's real estate markets. On the surface, we have a great tax regime. We have no capital gains tax and essentially no stamp duty. But, depending on your structure and the mood of the tax inspector, you might be liable to pay 10% VAT on your property. The same goes for income tax. For the majority of property owners, you only have 2% income tax on the sale of your property. But again, depending on your structure and your understanding of the law, which is often contradictory, you might be liable to 10% income tax or even maybe 20%. Furthermore, the Mongolian government is currently getting ready to discuss new taxation laws for real estate and we have absolutely no idea what those would be. Another challenge that we're facing is the uncertain legal future. Nearly every other Asian country I know of has some restrictions on foreign investment or foreign ownership in its real estate sector. Today, Mongolia has absolutely no restrictions or discrimination against foreign investors or foreign landlords apart from land ownership. As increasing amounts of foreign investments pour into Mongolia and impacts the market, we are bound to see new regulations being introduced concerning property rights. When or what they will be is anyone's guess. Mongolia's real estate market is still a very opaque sector, shrouded in layers of bureaucracy and administration. It is complex and difficult to obtain good, reliable and legally valid due diligence on property in Mongolia. While it is possible, it is a convoluted process that scares off large institutional investors. Institutional investors need to have their portfolios valued on a regular basis by a trusted international valuator that both has experience but also provides a legal backing for the valuation. This is currently not possible to do unless you bring in valuators from Kazakhstan and China who don't really understand the markets. For the market to truly evolve, these large institutional valuators will have to set up their offices in Bataar and send experienced expats to provide valuation services to institutional clients. Along the same line of thought, there are no globally recognised real estate companies currently operating in Mongolia. The biggest real estate players are all domestic, relatively small firms with excellent local knowledge but little international credibility. This is it for the real estate market span and the services that we at MAD Investment Solutions can provide, as well as the best way for you to gain exposure to Mongolia's real estate markets. 
MAD was created with the aim of providing a full range of turnkey services to foreign investors with a transparent fee structure. For those of our clients that wish to gain direct exposure to the markets, we normally start by sourcing and originating the best deals. If needed, we are then able to provide for renovation or small-scale construction in order to add value and then, depending on the client's wishes, to either rent or sell the property. If the property is rented, we provide ongoing property management services until such time as the clients decide to sell the property. We also provide a wide range of relocation services for those expats moving to Louisville, in addition to a range of service departments all located within UB City Centre. Beyond pure related services, we also provide a very comprehensive range of investment research services through our subsidiary company, Research Squared. Research Squared provides extensive due diligence services on the move of property, as well as land, site visits, market reports, feasibility studies, as well as ongoing consulting and advisory services for many of our larger clients. Clients who prefer to invest in a listed company and thus retain better liquidity are able to invest in a listed company, Real Estate Mongolia. Real Estate Mongolia will soon be listed in Toronto on the TSX and provide shareholders with access to a diversified range of investments across all asset classes, but most importantly, across Mongolia. REM benefits from an incredibly experienced management team that has spent an average of nine years on the ground and taken part in thousands of transactions. REM is currently open to pre-IPO funding and will be delighted in talking directly to investors about this great opportunity. Last but not least, if you would like to gain an in-depth understanding of the Mongolian resident markets, we suggest that you download the free executive summary of our groundbreaking research document, the Mongolian Real Estate Report 2020. The report is the first of its kind in Mongolia. It has taken a team of 15 people over nine months to compile. It's all based on primary sources and is an incredible piece of work. It is 450 pages of underground on on analysis of all asset classes and all sectors, but also covers most of Mongolia's secular cities and includes surprising prediction about the future of the market. The full report is available for sale from our websites. And a lot more information and analysis on the markets is also available on our website. If you would like to speak to us or meet us, please feel free to contact us at any point and come down to the office to say hello. Thank you for listening.